Hey guys, today's episode of Sports Spectrum's podcast is presented by our friends at Compassion International. They've been partners now with us for multiple years, and we're so glad to have them aboard with what we're doing here at Sports Spectrum, but we want to be on board with what they're doing, releasing children from poverty. Go check out Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum, and you'll see a list of children there, some waiting for more than 670 days when you think about that, that's more than almost two years, really, of kids waiting to be released from poverty. Places like Indonesia and Honduras and Ghana and Ecuador, Nicaragua. I mean, these are kids, young kids. We're talking six, seven, eight years old. And they look so beautiful when you look at them and you see them on the website. They're waiting for an opportunity. They're waiting for a chance. And you can help be that opportunity. You can help be that chance for them by sponsoring a child through Compassion International. And your support provides medical checkups, which in many cases saves a ton of lives. We're talking about nutritious food, health and hygiene training, and hearing about Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing. Compassion International is the real deal. I want to encourage you to check out the website, compassion.com slash sports spectrum, and pray about sponsoring a child and releasing a child from poverty today. This is the Sports Spectrum Podcast, where faith and sports intersect. Now let's bring in our host, former ESPN producer, Jason Romano. And welcome everyone to Sports Spectrum. I am Jason Romano. So glad you're tuning in to the show today. Our website is sportspectrum.com. That's the place to go. I mention it on every podcast, but it really is the home base for everything that we have going on at Sports Spectrum. If you want podcasts, if you want devotionals, if you want articles, stories, testimonials, even videos, all sorts of content and resources that are available for free, you can go to the website, sportspectrum.com. And if you have a guest idea, maybe a show topic, somebody we should be talking to here at Sports Spectrum, you can email me directly. Jason at sportspectrum.com is my email address. Jason at SportsSpectrum.com. Now today on the show, we're going to bring in a really cool guest, a guy that I remember rooting for as a high schooler, as a kid. Kevin Seitzer is our guest here today on Sports Spectrum. Kevin is currently coaching with the Atlanta Braves. And yes, I should preface by saying the world champion Atlanta Braves. He's their hitting coach there and has been there since 2014. Got that World Series championship last fall. He's a member of the Milwaukee Brewers Wall of Honor, and he's a two-time MLB All-Star. He came up with the Kansas City Royals back in 1986 as a player, and he played there from 86 to 91. That's when I remember him. He was an 11th-round draft pick in 1983 out of Eastern Illinois to Kansas City. And when he got called up in 1986 and then really was able to stay in the majors and was a rookie in 1987, I remember him. He played with Bo Jackson, another player you might remember. As a rookie, he was on teams with George Brett. I mean, the Royals had some good players. Kevin Seitzer was really good. He had 207 hits in his rookie year, which ties the Major League record by a rookie. And he hit 323. Seitzer was a great player and played a long time. He played all the way through till 1997 and had stints with the Brewers and the Athletics and the Cleveland Indians, and then moved on to coaching, and he was with the Diamondbacks and the Royals again, and then the Blue Jays, mostly as a hitting coach, and then came to the Braves back in 2015. That was his first full season with Atlanta, and now he gets that World Series championship. Kevin is also an outspoken man of faith. He loves Jesus, and we get a chance now to talk to Kevin Seitzer about his journey of faith, about winning the World Series, and lots of good stuff here. Cole Claiborne is going to sit in for me today and talk to Kevin Seitzer. I hope you enjoy the conversation with Cole and with the Braves hitting coach, Kevin Seitzer, here on Sports Spectrum. Well, Coach Kevin Seitzer, welcome to the Sports Spectrum podcast. How are you doing? Good, thanks. So, we're happy to have you on here talking, obviously, about baseball, but uh, as well as your walk with Jesus. I think we've got to start first though, with last fall, your Braves were able to take home the world series 
first time in quite a long time. Just walk me through that moment and really that whole run for your team because it felt like the last few years with the Braves, it, the Braves have been really, really close. And this year finally broke through. Just what was that moment like getting to, to see the final outs and, and raise that trophy? Yeah, words really can't describe it. I mean, you know, as that's what you shoot for. That's what you play the game for when we played. Now that's what you coach for as a coach. And, you know, it, it's your goal going into spring training. You work, you prepare, you go compete in the marathon of 162. Um, it's really hard to come out on top, let alone just get to the postseason. So it's, you know, for us, it's been four years in a row of making the postseason. This year was probably the most challenging because we, we couldn't get over 500 till we were into August. And we had a lot of injuries, um, as do a lot of teams, but we just couldn't go. I mean, we didn't, we didn't get it hot. We were, we were kind of floundering through most of the season and it was, it was a grind and guys were, were trying and competing and getting after it. We just couldn't get hot. So, you know, we, we felt like once we did get on a streak, a roll, you know, the, the greatest blessing for us was Philly, New York, Washington, and uh, uh, Miami didn't go anywhere. They, they let us hang close. And then once we made the deals, um, Alex made the trades at the end of the dead at the deadline. And it just, in, it was a, an infusion of energy um, and confidence. Uh, I, I couldn't believe how it pushed us over the hump just from an emotional standpoint in that clubhouse and in that dugout every night of what kind of confidence we felt like we had now. And then we got on a roll and, you know, it wasn't just the four hitters that we added, our pitchers stepped up big time. So it was just, it was a, a tremendous team effort and then getting to the postseason and, um, you know, going up against the, the opponents that we did in Milwaukee's pitching staff and then the Dodgers, maybe the best pitching staff in all of baseball for many years. I mean, that that's one of the best staffs I think I've ever seen. And, you know, 20 some years in the game and it was, it was real difficult. Let's put it that way, but our guys stepped up, got some hits when we needed to, but the biggest thing was what our pitchers did to, to take us to the promised land. Yeah, I mean, you know, every sport has its own grind in its own way. It's always hard, no matter what, you know, to get to the to get to the championship to win it. Doesn't matter what sport, it's hard. But baseball, you're, you're playing 162 games, and that's a lot. And I know baseball is a, is a different animal than maybe football and that sort of thing. But 162 games plus another full month of a postseason—that's a grind. So I guess first, just walk me through the mental toughness that it takes a baseball team to not only navigate through a regular season to make it to the postseason, but then to have enough mental fortitude to make it through the postseason and win a World Series. What is that? What what kind of a character does a team have to have to be able to pull that off? You you just have to be you have to be filled with a bunch of fighters. I mean, that's what it boils down to. Unafraid, accepting challenges, bring bring your A game every single day, your work ethic, leave your complaints and your your whatever on the shelf, and you go out and you you go fight for your teammates and you know, the love that, that these guys had for each other, the, I mean, it was, and it's been that way since this, this was my seventh year here. And it's been that way since I've been here. It's the most tightest group of players that you've, you could ever imagine. And that's, that's the big thing of getting over the top guys are there to, to pull for each other, to, to pick each other up and, to fight for each other. And mm -hmm. it's, that's the number one thing. And that's what, that's what we had. And, you know, I just couldn't be more proud of, of all of our guys. And I, I say that from an offensive standpoint, defense, pitching, every phase of the game. I mean, from the front office with our analytics and what they give us and bring to the table and the game plan that we have, the, the work ethic, 
and the, the preparation of all the coaches. And I mean, it was a, it was a well-oiled unit that we put out there. Yeah. It seems just from a, from a, a baseball fan watching that any championship team has got to have good camaraderie, but it seemed like this Braves team, a lot of those core guys have been together for a number of years and it seemed like they were poised to win a title. I know that was something that Dansby said he was on the sports spectrum podcast shortly before the 2021 season. I think it's around there. Maybe it was, maybe it was before the pandemic shortened season now that I think about it, but he was saying how he felt like there was a core group of guys that they were just so, so close to breaking through. And he felt like that was coming soon. And, and 2021, ended up being that year for the Braves. So when you get through a grind like that, you know, a championship is obviously a a very rewarding feeling, but to get through a whole grind of a 162 game season, then through the playoffs, does that add a certain element uh, of, of a rewarding feeling, just how tough it is? I mean, you start baseball season really in February, pitchers and, and catchers report to spring training, go to early November in some cases, which I think this year went into November to mm-hmm. win a title. I mean, that's the majority of a calendar year that you're engaged in a sport in a season and you get to it and you get to be the team holding the trophy. So obviously winning is going to be a, a reward, but just you think back to the preparations you make in February to where you get to at the end of the year, does that add a certain extra layer of just a rewarding feeling, especially for you as a coach? Yeah. The, the satisfactions, I mean, overwhelming, to be honest. I mean, I've, I came within one game as a player Mm -hmm. of winning the World Series, and it was the last year that I played. I retired after game seven in 97, and it's been a burr in my saddle ever since. And, you know, it was – I'd only got to the playoffs two times as a player, and now this has, you know, been four times as a coach. And then to finally get over that hump and – and win that World Series and the first year of your baseball career that you're not disappointed after the last game of the year is just unbelievable. Yeah. And I and you know the the grind and the fight and the battle people don't realize when we get there in February we get like 2 days off in yeah. 6 7 weeks that we're there and then during the course of the season we'll get 3 to 4 days off a month. And so we really don't know how to act on days <laughs> off because we're used to going to war every single day. I mean, it, it's a it's a daily preparation to go fight and battle every day. And you you know, that's what you do. You put your head down, you get after it and you, you don't come up for air until it's over. And and I will take this every year every year, the rest of my life. (laughs) (laughs) That's gotta be, I mean, even for you just personally, you get so close as a player and then now you finally get the, get the ring as a, as a coach. What has your perspective on winning and losing shifted at all from being, you know, whenever you're a player, you're engaged in the game or you're on the field. It's a little bit different of a perspective as a coach. Uh, I don't know. Does this, does this change at all? Like you win as a coach, is it, is it more rewarding about the same as you would have thought it would have been as a player or do, what's the perspective like winning now as a coach, whenever you got so close as a player? That's a, that's a great question. And I hadn't thought about it until just now, <laughs> but I would say it's probably more rewarding slightly, not a lot, but more rewarding as a coach just because the investment that we have in mm-hmm. many guys and when you play it's it's yourself you you know you you are contributing as an individual and doing the best you can and sometimes you have good years sometimes you have bad years and sometimes you know we came up short because of me and sometimes we came up short because of whatever part of our team wasn't clicking. And, you know, when you win as a coach, it takes every part of your team and especially, you know, the pitching coach, the bullpen coach, the, the, the all the assistant coaches, the bench coach, uh, all the extra coaches, we all have to come together and get all these players on the same page, pushing in the same direction. And, And then when you win it, it's like, holy cow, we all did it, you know? And so it just feels a lot, feels better that way. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Pretty cool. 
Yeah. I appreciate that. Cause that's a, that's a really cool perspective. Just that, you know, as a coach, you're, you're seeing all phases of it. Whereas a player, you might kind of be focused on, I want to execute my position. I want to execute what I'm capable of. But now as a, as a coach, you've got a little bit more that's under your, your wing, so to speak. And, and you kind of have a little bit more say, I guess, in the organization as a whole. And yeah, I, I could see why that would be a different, a different feeling as a coach winning versus a player. So uh, for you guys as, as, as an organization with the Braves, I know that there are a lot of guys in there that, that have a strong faith and, how much did that play a role in this run this year? I mean, I know you got a core group of guys that have been together, that played together, but you've also got a core group of guys that all share the same faith in Jesus. And what, what's what's the locker room like, and how much did their their shared faith play into the bond that that helped this team win? Well, I mean, we all know that without our faith, we're not going anywhere. And to be able to endure the trials and the struggles and the pressures and the stress and the anxiety, all of the things that go into a high pressure job. I mean, we're all smack in the middle of it. And without our faith in Christ, I mean, you know, we're, we're struggling, we're, we're short, we're, you know, maybe we get too frustrated, we let down. Um, but God gives us a strength to keep going every day. And we all lean on each other for it. And you know, the, we get the 15 minutes of chapel on Sundays, um, but it's a daily, I mean, it's a daily devotion that you have to have in order to, to get the strength to, to be able to get through all of this. I mean, I learned back when I was a player, I mean, this was the only way I was going to make it. And so, you know, you just continue and, and from a coaching standpoint, you know, we don't have our locker in the locker room with all the players and, you know, you, it's it's kind of um let's just say you got to be real sensitive to the leading of the holy spirit as a coach you know about uh sharing your faith and and how you do it and when you do it and with with who you do it and and so you know i commit i commit a lot of time every morning in prayer for you know for our guys for our organization and and just for me as a coach to be, have the wisdom and discernment and knowledge understanding and just to be sensitive to the leading of the spirit whenever i need to throw something out there and it, sometimes it may have something to do with where your hand position is and where your feet are and you know what you may be thinking about when you're in the box and you know, it's not, it may not always be Bible related leading. It could be, you know, what helps these guys to be able to make an adjustment to, to get it going. So, but we got a lot of guys that, that really are dedicated um, to their faith. And it, it's, it's pretty awesome when you go into our chapels and, you know, you see six, seven, eight, nine guys show up and, and then go out there and, you know, throw their guts on the line for the team. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I was going to ask who, who are some of those guys? I mean, I know we've had Dansby Swanson on the show before, but uh, who are some of the guys in the, in the Braves locker room that you see as leaders when it comes to, to faith and, and leading other guys in faith? Well, Adam Duvall was another one. Freddie Freeman's another one. Um, Austin Riley. Uh, we have, mm -hmm. you know, there's guys who would, who would come and go. Travis darno has been before. Um, he's come on occasion, Bobby Magliani's, uh, assistant hitting coach with me, Jose Castro's come before too. I mean, we got guys that, you know, I, I wouldn't, sometimes chapel can be difficult yeah. just depend on what you got with your pregame treatment. And, you know, we got guys that are banged up all the time that are trying to put their bodies together. And that's usually on a day game in the morning when the body's not cooperating real good. So, you know, it, it's, it's not like, Oh, if we don't see guys every week, they're not really dedicated. It's not the case, but it's chapel's huge. And we all know who's in there with us and, and whether they're in there or not in there, we're all in there together. Yeah. That's great. So walk me through your, your playing career. So we've talked quite a bit, you know, you, you've had a great experience here with the Braves and, you know, great coaching career, but with playing career, you played for 12 years, had, I think two all-star appearances, a really solid career, got close to winning the world series, as you said, 
how did faith play into to your life whenever you were going through the major leagues as a player? Because it's much different, you know, when you're in your early 20s and 30s versus now in your adulthood, later adulthood. What was faith like for you uh, when you were in that that phase of life? And what were some of the trials you faced during your playing career that your faith helped you overcome? Um, I mean, well, growing up, I grew up in a small town, came from nothing. Um knew that it wasn't going to take a lot to make me happy, you know, as far as money goes and things like that. Um, but basically it, it came down for me. I grew up in the church, believed in God, believed in Jesus, um, but had never or did know that I needed a personal relationship with him. And, but I, but it was church was very important to me. Chapel was very important coming up. And basically it was after my second year in the big leagues that I realized I, I don't think I can do anything more to feel more fulfilled uh, as a, as a person on this earth, you know, having success, having money and feeling the emptiness that I felt made me start asking questions. Mm -hmm. And that was what ended up leading me to a pro athletes outreach conference um, that I went to uh, having marriage problems at the time. And so went there for that, but ended up getting hit upside the head with, you know, a testimony that related to me perfectly. And I ended up surrendering my life to Christ that night. And guys, that was November 2nd, 1988. So, wow. It's been a long time. Um, the The emptiness was gone. I was felt like I my pot of gold at the end of the rainbow was full for the first time instead <laughs> of being empty. And um, you know, it was it was what I leaned on the rest of my career, rest of my life. I mean, ever since it's uh, it's been the number one most important thing to me. What was what was in that testimony that that struck a chord with you? It was basically uh, a guy sharing his his life that just basically paralleled with mine. Okay, one hundred percent. I mean, it was you know coming from nothing, making it to the big leagues, realizing there was something missing. Started asking questions. Thought he was a Christian because he believed in God. Real, you know, all all the same stuff that with me me and I was like oh my gosh this is unbelievable so it was orchestrated from heaven and it was life-changing immediately for me so it was pretty cool that's awesome that's a great story so and we know as Christians you know when, when we accept God it doesn't mean that our life is necessarily going to become this cakewalk sometimes it actually becomes harder and so as you went through your your playing career what were maybe some of the, the biggest hurdles that you had to face? I think I maybe asked a, a version of this earlier, but what, what were some of the biggest hurdles you had to face maybe even later in your life or later in your career, maybe around the time when you had to decide, is this time to call it quits, which I can imagine as an athlete, that could be a hard decision. But what were, what were some of those hard times during your maybe personal life too, but just that span later on in your career? Uh, and, and how did you, how did your, how did your faith help you through those trials and those, and those fires of life? Well, I mean, for me, it was when I, when I, before I became a Christian, I was doing really good. Mm -hmm. After I became a Christian, I stunk for four years. <laughs> and that was really hard because, yeah. you know, it's like, it's easy to be a Christian when everything's going good, but when yeah. it's going bad, that's when you're going to find out the, the, where the rubber meets the road and people are going to really be watching, especially if they know that you you've made a commitment to Christ and okay, let's see how he responds. And, you know, the, all of the growth that has to happen, you know, when you're a young believer, you know, the, you have to, you have to realize what the promises are and get in God's word and study it. And, you know, when, when you come to a place where you realize that there's, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control that you have at your disposal anytime you want and need it. And you start to see the fruit coming out. Um, it, it's pretty impactful, especially when it's during trials and that, you know, when you're stinking in this game and 
I got released twice after I became a Christian. And, you know, it was, it was all a part of the journey. I say to prepare me to be a coach because you can't, no player can go through any part of his career that I haven't walked through as well. Yeah. I mean, it, it, having having all kinds of success to having all kinds of failure to having more friends than you ever thought you could imagine to not having any friends because you were stinking and people kicking you to the curb and you know it was it was it was a challenge so I mean it was on the field off the field every phase like you said, when you become a Christian, it doesn't mean that life's going to be a bed of roses and, and a cakewalk. It wasn't, but the strength that you get on a daily basis to get through whatever situation you're in the middle of when God says he'll never give you more than you can handle, that's his promise. And, you know, went through a divorce after 20 years of marriage after I retired too and and ended up meeting the most amazing woman on the, on the earth and we got married and now we've been married 16 years. And wow. so it all worked out great, even though it was hell I went through at the time, you know, it all ended up working out for the best. And that's another promise. I mean, he's, he promises that he's going to work everything out for the good for those who love him. So, you know, when you get in there and you start seeing the promises and you trust in the promises, the rest is just hold on and, you know, wrap your arms around your faith and, mm -hmm. and your relationship with Christ and, and just try and obey and do what, do what you surrender every day. You will try and obey. You want to be disciplined, you, you know, you want wisdom. And those are things I pray for on a daily basis every, every morning, you know, just because I don't want to get in the middle of screwing things up for me or my family or my organization, you know, it, it's you, if you, if you walk with Christ and you live for him, you got a chance to, to do some good things to help people. And that's what it's all about. It's a great perspective. It makes me think of James one, two, three, four, you know, the, the, the testing of our faith brings endurance that, that verse and the, you know, the trials that we face are going to bring endurance. That that's basically saying we should consider it pure joy. When we go through those times, it's a really hard concept right. to accept that we go through hard times and we should accept it as pure joy on almost celebrate those times because God is strengthening our faith and he, and he is uh, bringing endurance in our faith and, and we're going closer to him. So it's kind of the a dichotomy, you know, where you ideally you would not want to look forward to hard times. If we're kind of told in the, in the, in that verse there, actually you want to look forward to it. So that's what strikes out to me about your story there. I love that. I love that perspective too. As a coach, you said it, it that prepared you more as a coach when, when you've had players that have gone through those ty types of things, how much of that, that mentor aspect of being a coach, do you enjoy? I mean, it, it's everything. I mean, my, my whole, my whole, love for coaching is just being able to have a positive impact on people's lives to help them get through stress and pain and suffering and be able to make adjustments to to have success and and you know the the mental side the the emotional side of this game is so hard on these guys and you know, we've talked about the marathon and, and what seven months of baseball can feel like on these guys with the pressure and everything. And so, you know, when you've, when you've lived it, you, you've felt it, you've tasted it and smelled it, what everything that they're going through, it's like, you know, when, when you talk about adjustments, it's because you've been there. And, and a lot of times it's not things that I did. It's things that my teammates did, you know, or, or people that I respected a lot in the game that conversations I had with different great players, great hitters, hall of famers. And, and when I say Rod Carew said this to me one time in a conversation or Don Mattingly said this, or Kirby Puckett said this, or Mark McGuire said this, you know, it's like they they look up and like, oh, my gosh. And then they tell you things, you know, well, I had a conversation with Barry Bonds and he was telling me that da, 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 and I'm like, oh, my gosh, that is so cool. So you put that in your toolbox and you can use that later on 
and say, okay, this guy told me he had a conversation with Barry Bonds. Barry's da 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 da. Yeah. You just never know what's going to click with guys. And so it, it's all about just being able to make yourself available. Um, there's there's no ego involved. It, it's it's all about helping people and and getting getting to a championship ring. And we did it. <laughs> That seems like that's that's that seems like the ultimate uh, reward as a coach right there. Not only not only being able to pour into the players as humans, but to get to celebrate with their on field accomplishments as well. That's really cool. One last question here: What's one thing in this season of life that you are in that you feel like God is teaching you right now? Wow. So every year. I'll, you know, the new year's resolution thing, this is, uh, I, I, I heard this before of don't do new year's resolutions, pick a word yeah, that you're going to commit to for the year. And, uh, I've been doing it the last four years. And so I pray ahead of time for a couple of weeks before we get to new year's day and like, God, give me the word for the year. And this year is rest. Mm. And so everything we went through last year, I mean, all the great stuff as a team that we, we were able to, to accomplish, there was, there was a lot of hard times that went with it. I missed, I had not missed a day as a coach in 12 years and I ended up missing a month because I had a hip replacement in the middle of the season, emergency hip replacement that went bad and had problems. And so anyway, it was pain and suffering all the way to the end for me. And we get to the playoffs and then my wife has to have an emergency pace setter put in out of oh, wow. nowhere that it was like, I mean, you know, one of those things where the, the nurses told us that, this is what causes people to die in their sleep. And they never knew anything was wrong. And so, you know, you look back on it and you, you had so many trials and struggles and, and then what happened with us as a team with all the injuries and the grind and the struggle there and, and, and then to endure and to come out on top, you know, it was like, <laughs> God, give me the word. And he goes, you need to rest mm -hmm. in me. And so that's my goal this year is to continue to do what I've been doing, but to maybe not be quite as stressed out along the way, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And cut yourself a little bit of a break if you do have to take a month off or whatever the case is. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, coach. Thanks for joining us on Sports Spectrum. This was a great conversation. Really appreciate your perspective and learning a little bit about what the Braves environment looks like and obviously your story as well. So thanks for sharing and hopefully uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. And many thanks to Kevin Seitzer, the Braves hitting coach, for joining us here today on Sports Spectrum. Make sure you check out our website, sportspectrum.com, for a couple of reasons. First, it's just got a ton of great resources there. When you go check out the website, articles, podcasts, devotionals. But when you're there, at the top of the website, click the magazine icon, that word magazine. It'll take you to our Sports Spectrum magazine webpage and a chance for you to subscribe to Sports Spectrum's quarterly magazine. Super cheap, $18 for an entire year subscription. It sews into this ministry of Sports Spectrum. The magazine has been around since 1985 and it's still a great resource. I think it's the best thing that we do here at Sports Spectrum. Adam Wainwright is on the cover with his wife, Jenny, and it's a great family baseball pitching story that we share, faith story as well, of Adam and Jenny. But also inside the magazine is a great article on the faith of the Atlanta Braves. Kevin Seitzer is a part of that story. And if you like this podcast, I think you'll really love the story that's written in the current issue of Sports Spectrum's magazine with Kevin Seitzer and the rest of the Atlanta Braves players and coaches that participated in that 
piece. So you got to check it out at SportsSpectrum.com. Click the magazine icon, subscribe today, and get your copy of Sports Spectrum's spring edition of the magazine. Again, thanks for tuning in. We love you guys. We're so grateful that you tuned into the show today. Click that follow button or that subscribe button on whatever app you're listening to this podcast on so that you never miss an episode. And then please do join us next time right here on Sports Spectrum. Have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you next time.